2015 study, Microsoft wanted to look at the effects of the digital revolution on people's attention spans, which they define as how long does it take before we lose concentration and start looking at something else. And I'm going to tell you the results, what they found in a few minutes, because they uh, studied the brains of over 2,100 participants uh, using a combination of surveys and EEGs to see how long people could concentrate on any one thing before they lost focus. And just for comparison's sake, let's look at some of the, some of the attention spans of animals in the animal kingdom. A squirrel, for example, has an attention span on normal things of about one second. Uh, and about four minutes on acorn and nut-related issues. That's really what the survey said, nut-related issues. Um, a cat's attention span is between two and ten minutes. Dogs max out around two minutes. But understand that, that when you talk about dogs, they don't measure attention span in terms of minutes. They measure it in terms of ounces. So a, you're eating a hamburger, a dog's attention span is about a quarter pound. Uh, you're eating a steak, a dog's attention span is about 12 ounces. That's just how it is for, for dogs. Goldfish have an attention span of nine seconds. And how they arrived at that, I, I don't know. But According to a new study from Microsoft, people now gener generally lose concentration after eight seconds, which means that it has been scientifically verified that we have a shorter attention span than a goldfish, which makes preaching for 30 minutes a real challenge. I'll just, <laughs> some of y'all are going, wait, who are you again? Uh, <laughs> And we're in this study, this is week five of a study about the path of life, discovering ancient wisdom for everyday living. And we've been looking at uh, the book of Proverbs as we've gone through this. You know, Proverbs talks about the path of our life over 25 times. There's 29 different times in Proverbs that something about the path for our lives is, is mentioned or referred to. Proverbs warns us about walking with people uh, with questionable morals. In Proverbs 1.15, it says, My son, do not go along with them. Don't set foot on their paths. Proverbs 2.9 says that when we follow the way of wisdom, we will understand what is right and, and fair, every good path. So Proverbs warns us against taking paths that are wrong, and it tells us the reward for choosing those paths that are right, those paths that, that honor God. A few weeks ago when we talked about uh, the human heart's role in decision making, we talked about how the heart is deceitful above all things. The heart convinces you that you really need a truck when you're not a truck kind of guy. Uh, we talked about uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, how we trust in the Lord with all of our heart and don't lean on our own understanding. And then in all your ways, acknowledge God, and he will make your paths straight. And so all of these have reinforced and kind of support what Andy Stanley calls the principle of the path. And the principle of the path, according to Andy Stanley, is that it's our direction, not our intention, that determines destination, that ultimately where you wind up in life is not based on your intentions. It's based on putting one foot in front of the other, in front of the other, on whatever path you are on. But here's the question. How do you decide what path to be on in the first place? And it's at this point that Andy Stanley, in his book, goes from talking about the principle of the path, direction determines destination, to the principle of focus. How do you decide which direction to go in the first place? It's the principle of focus, and it is this, that attention determines direction. Attention determines direction. That is, whatever you are looking at tends to guide the direction your feet take you. And we all kind of learned this in driver's ed, right? 
or at least we were supposed to, where your driver, your, your driving instructor would tell you, don't look over at the car that is next to you. Because when you do, you will tend to veer over in that lane. And so if, for example, you see a really nice Ford F-150 Raptor in the lane next to you, and you start focusing on that and, and thinking about what the Kelly Blue Book is on that particular car, guess what happens? You, Yeah, exactly. Exactly. What did I drop? Oh, it's probably expensive. Um, and it's the same, guys, if you pay attention to the female that is driving said car in your left lane. You will tend to veer over into that direction. And so attention, what we are focused on, determines our direction. And so when you put it all together, attention determines direction, determines destination. And so whatever you are focusing on has a huge part to play in your ultimate destiny. And so Proverbs 4, 25 through 27 makes this plain where Solomon says to his son, My son, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet. And take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. So I want you to notice something. That first and foremost, according to this passage and according to what we understand about our, our psychology and the way we're wired, first and foremost, direction is chosen by where we look. By what we turn our eyes toward. That's why the proverb says, let your, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Now, there's a story in the book of Genesis that illustrates this pretty graphically. It's the story of Abraham and Lot, or specifically about Lot. And you guys probably know how the story of Lot ends up. Right? Lot was Abraham's nephew. He wound up living in a very wicked city called Sodom. And when God decided to destroy the city of Sodom, he saved Lot. And you probably know some of the details about that story. But I wonder if you know what led up to the fact that Lot was living in Sodom. How did he get to that point? He's Abraham's nephew. He's, he's walking closely with God. But somehow he winds up in a place that he probably never intended to be. And, and the story actually starts in Genesis 13. And what I want us to notice as we kind of track this story is how much like Lot we are. We're a lot like Lot. Because here's what happens. Abraham's, uh, or Abram at the time, his uh, herdsmen and shepherds were quarreling and fighting with his nephew's, nephew's herdsmen because there just wasn't space in where they were to water all of those flocks and to keep them all fed. And so they were quarreling. And so it says in, in verse 8, or yeah, verse 8, Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before you. So let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And here's the first thing that you need to notice. Genesis 13, 10, Lot looked and saw. Where did he put his focus? Lot looked and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan toward Zoar was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east, and the two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Phase one, step one, he looked and saw. He saw it look good. He saw it was well watered. He saw it was green and pleasant to look at. And so first he looks in that direction, and then he pitches his tents near Sodom. 
Now, he knew about the reputation. It says in the very next verse, now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning against the Lord. So it was no secret to anybody what was going on in Sodom. But Lot looked in that direction and he saw that it was pleasant. And he saw that it looked good. And so we're still very far away from the city, right? I'm just going to pitch my tents in that direction because it's got a good view. But I would never think about living there, would I? Except that he does. The next time we see Lot, there's this, it's the, the conclusion of this epic battle where four kings on one side were lined up against five kings on another side. And so this battle of nine kings, four against five, one of the losing kings was the king of Sodom. And if you skip down to Genesis 14, 11, and 12, it says the four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. Then they went away, verse verse 12. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. Uh Uh-oh. First he looked. Next he pitched his tents in that direction. Now he's living in Sodom and Abraham has to rescue him out of the city. Now, the next time we see Lot, we fast forward to Genesis chapter 19. And now, the wickedness of Sodom has reached the Lord. And we've gotten past the point where where he's revealing his plan to Abraham, and Abraham is trying to, to talk him down. Well, if there's 50 righteous people in the city, would you still destroy the city? If there's 40, if there's 30, if there's 10 righteous people, would you still destroy the city? And God says, for the sake of 10, I would not destroy the city. And so uh, God dispatches two of his angels to, to Sodom. And it says in Genesis 19, 1... The two angels arrived in Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting at the gateway of the city by that point. And what you need to understand about uh, ancient Near East culture was that to sit in the gate, that's where business was transacted. That's where decisions were made. And so not only is he living in Sodom by this point, but he has a position of some authority. He has become a well-respected member of the community. And so, do you see the progression? Let me ask you this. Do you think he ever intended to get there? Because we know that after this, the outcry has become so great against the city of Sodom, God has already made up his mind to destroy it. And sure enough, Lot sees these two angels and they say, oh, we'll just spend the night in the city square. And Lot says, oh, no, 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 don't do that. Come under my roof, be under my protection. And that night, the men of the city start pounding on Lot's door and say, bring out these two men that are staying with you. We would know them and we'll just leave it with the King James because there's children present. We would know them. And Lot comes to the point of saying, no, don't do this to the men who have come under protection of my roof. Here, take my virgin daughters who have known no men. How did it come to this point? Imagine Lot's thought process and think about Our thought processes, anytime you find yourself in a relationship that you never intended to be in a part of, anytime that you find yourself way over your head in your finances, anytime that you find yourself stuck in a sin that you just cannot get victory over, think about the process that got Lot to where he was. Maybe it went something like this. Wow. Can you believe what's going on over there? I can't believe they would do that. I just, wow. I probably shouldn't go over there. Well, maybe I should just go over there and and see what's going on. Maybe I should just do a, a prayer walk around the city. 
wow, I can't believe they live like that. Maybe, oh, I shouldn't have gone over there. I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have done that. I should not have done that. I should not have gone over there. Well, maybe I should go back. Maybe, maybe now I can handle it. Maybe, maybe now I'll be all right. Maybe now I've matured enough to, to, to handle it. Because it sure looks like they're having a good time over there. And before we know it, because we started with the look, and then we set our attention in that direction, and then we decided maybe it wouldn't be so bad to, to walk with them for a little while. And maybe I can just sit down and, and join them for a little while. And maybe I can be a witness to them. And before we know it, we are stuck in a pattern of sin. We're stuck in a relationship. We're stuck in upside down finances. Because we thought it would be okay just to look for a little while. Ravi Zacharias said this. I thought it was a quote from Adrian Rogers, but I guess Adrian Rogers just preached it more often than Ravi did. But the quote is this. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, and it will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. And that is true 100% of the time. And the thing is, when we see somebody that has fallen, that has become a victim of moral failure. And guys, we see it over and over and over, don't we? But when we see somebody, sometimes the justification is we say, well, he's, he's only human. And it's like we expect people to, to give in because that's just human nature. But this is so important. Please hear this. What makes us human is not the inevitability of falling to temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to all men. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but with every temptation, He will provide the way of escape. So falling to, to temptation is not what makes us human. What makes us human is our ability to say no to temptation because that's how God wired us it has everything to do with our ability to choose what to focus our attention on that's what makes us different from dogs and cats i mean as soon as a dog smells food boom that's where his attention is he can't help it it's his in instinct cats are a little different anybody have a dog and a cat just curious yeah pray for us we're a, a select group um but you look at a cat, when a cat sees motion, when it sees some prey, his attention is right there and it's focused there. But again, it's instinct. Animals cannot help what they focus on. But humans can. Because if we couldn't, God wouldn't give us so many verses that talk about the choices that we have and what to pay attention to. We'll get to some of those verses in a minute. But just understand the difference between talking about something grabbing our attention or something capturing our attention. Those are passive words where we act like we're the victim of whatever catches our eye. We're the victim of whatever grabs our focus for a minute. But now think about phrases we use like pay attention and give our attention. Suddenly we become the active agents of what we focus on. What's the difference? Well, emotions fuel what grabs our attention. Whether it's lust or greed or hormones, there's a lot of emotions that fuel what grab our attention. That's what happened to King David in 2 Samuel. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. Emotions fueled what grabbed his attention. He saw a beautiful woman bathing. And he was grabbed. He was captured. So when he goes to inquire about her, the man said, She's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, one of your mighty men, David. You know, her. Her, her husband is one of your guys. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. He wasn't going to get talked off that ledge because emotions grabbed his attention. 
But understand this, intentionality fuels what we pay attention to. And God has given us the capacity to choose what we focus our attention on. That's why you see things like Psalm 101, 3. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. That's a choice. Students, that's a choice. I will not set my eyes before anything that's worthless. Job 31, 1. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look, look lustfully at a woman. Philippians 3, 13 through 15 is where Paul says, One thing I do, forgetting what's behind me and straining towards what's ahead of me, I, 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 I fix my eyes and I focus on the, the prize of the upward calling in Christ Jesus. And he says in verse 15, All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. It's a choice. We can choose what we set our attention on. Hebrews 2.1 gives us the warning, we must pay the most careful attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift away over and over and over. Scripture reinforces that when it comes to what we focus our attention on, we have a choice. And you say, but how can we do that when we are so bombarded in our culture by all of these images, by all of these, these thoughts, by all of these lyrics, by all of these uh, YouTube channels, by all of these apps, by all of these things that we can just click on? How can we, how can we get away from it? Well, Martin Luther said it this way. He said, you cannot keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. You can't help the images that, that go by your eyes multiple times a day. And I'm sorry I keep on looking at you guys. I know it's getting awkward. It's true for all of us. You can't help the, vision, the, the visual images that, that go by your eyes hundreds of times a day. But you don't have to stay there. You don't have to dwell on them. You can, uh, last time I talked about this, Diana Hall said, I want you to tell them how to do it, how to overcome that. So here's how you do it. Hide God's word in your heart that you may not sin against God. Flee from every form of, of temptation. Run away. I feel like that scene out of Monty Python. Run away. That's what you do with, with, with temptation. You flee. You hide God's word in your heart so that you know, may not sin against God. Quote scripture. The Awana program is so good for helping you guys build up a foundation of scripture that you can use when you're facing temptation. But pay attention to all of the active phrases again in, in verses 25 through 27 of, of Proverbs 4. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Focus on what's ahead of you. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet. You can choose where to walk. You can choose where you spend your time. Make level paths for your feet. Take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. And when you do that, you begin to take control of those things that you give your attention to. And you don't have to blame it on, well, it just grabbed my attention. Because we're humans. We're made in the image of God and we have a choice. Now, I want to come to the point where this is the most important thing that we're going to talk about all morning long, okay? Because up to this point, you're thinking, well, is it just about sex and lust and porn and, and what we click on and what we listen to? Is, is this where all the, the only thing that this sermon is going to go to? No, it's not. And I know that there's been a lot of times in this particular series when I've said things like, you know what? You don't even have to be a Christian for this to be to work in your life. If, if direction determines destination, you can take a different direction with weight loss or exercise or finances or financial peace or relationships. You don't even have to be a Christian to see how this works in your life. And all that is true. But the most important thing that I need you to understand about this message is that this isn't just about this life. It's also about the next one. Direction determines destination. Attention determines direction. 
And if you walk out of here thinking, well, this is just super practical and helpful, and now I know how to have a better relationship with my wife, now I know how to manage my finances better, or how to be a better student, man, we've failed. Because this isn't just about this life, it's also about the next life. The writer of Hebrews says, or I'm sorry, Paul in Ephesians says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Be careful about how you live because how you live in this life impacts your destination in the next life. It's that line from Gladiator, what we do here echoes in eternity. And the days that we live in are evil. And the temptations around us are vast. And the opportunities to get off track spiritually are manifold. And we encounter them every single day. So we have to pay attention to how we live, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And if Proverbs 4.25 says, let our eyes look straight ahead and fix our gaze directly before us, what is ahead of us? What is before us? Hebrews gives us the answer in 12.2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. We talked about how we are made in the image of God, and we have a choice as to what we will fix our attention on. Jesus lived as a human being. He lived a perfect life, and he made a choice what he would focus his attention on. Hebrews 12, 2 says he endured the cross. He despised the shame. Why? Because he sought a relationship with us. He sought to make the relationship that had been broken in the Garden of Eden when we took our focus away from God's plan for our lives and instead focused on what we wanted, what looked good to us. He wanted to restore that relationship. And so he made a way. Jesus made a path for us. When he gave his life on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven, so that that relationship could be restored. And he talked about it in terms of a path, didn't he? John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if we choose to place our focus, to place our trust in Jesus, and to walk that path, that direction determines our destination. And that focus on Jesus as the only one who can forgive us of our sins, as the only one who can make us right, as the only one that can restore that relationship that was lost in the Garden of Eden, if we put our focus on Jesus, that will determine our direction in this life and to the next Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That is the only way to determine our direction into eternity. It's the only way. Salvation is found in no one else, says Acts 4.12. For there's no other name given under heaven to men by which we must be saved. Attention determines direction determines destination what do you have your attention on right now and if all you come away with is practical tips for improving your relationship with your spouse out of this series we have failed jesus tells a parable in luke 12 and it goes like this the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest he thought to himself what shall i do i have no place to store my crops Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be happy. We would look at this guy and say, okay, here's a guy who focused on the right things. He was a savvy businessman. 
When his ground produced abundant crops, he said, I've got to store this. I've got to sock it away. I've got to uh, pad my nest egg. These are my wealth building years. So I'm going to focus on this. And we in our world would applaud him. Way to be wise. Way to pay attention to the market. Way to plan for the future. We would say all of those things to this man who made these decisions, who seemed from a worldly perspective to have his focus in the right place. But what would God say about him? But God said to him, You fool. This day, this very night, your life will be required of you. Then what will you get? Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? The world might evaluate that man as wise and smart and savvy and planning for the future. God looks at him and says, you fool. Because your focus was on the here and now. And Paul says, let us be wise, making the most of opportunity, because the days are evil. I want to ask you, have you determined where your focus is going to be? And have you let that determine the direction of your life? Is your focus on the here and now, providing for yourself, providing for your family? There's nothing wrong with that. But if that's the only place where your focus is, your destination is not going to be where you want it to be. Or is your focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame? Your attention determines your direction, and your direction determines your destination. Where is your attention right now? Would you please stand with me? I want to ask you, if you've never made a a decision, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior, then your focus has been in the wrong place. And this morning, here and now, you can make a decision that will determine your ultimate destination. And if you've never done that before, I would invite you to do it this morning. To simply say, Father... I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I have followed my own way. I know that I've followed my own focus. Here and now, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to come into my life and be my Savior. I surrender my life to your Lordship. Thank you for saving me. And when you pray that, and when you mean it, it's not the words that matter, but when you pray that and when you mean it, the Bible says that God comes in And he takes over lordship. He takes over control of your life. And that affects your ultimate destiny. If you've never done that, we want to give you an opportunity to do that this morning.